The city was in a terrible state of panic. The Bolsheviks were basically taking everything they could out of Yekaterinburg that was worth anything because it was the center of the mining industry. So it was gold semi and precious minerals. And um, they wanted to get that all out before the city fell. So in terms of taking the imperial family there, what do you think uh, the Tsar, for example, must have felt when he knew they were going to Ekaterinburg? Ekaterinburg had a large factory and industrial population of very heavily politicized workers who were very loyal Bolsheviks. And the Tsar's heart sank when he was told that he was going to be taken there. He said, I would go anywhere but for Yekaterinburg, because the people there are so against me. Once the family arrived in Yekaterinburg, they lived in increasingly horrible circumstances. They were actually told the minute they arrived, you are now entering a prison regime. And there was a big difference between how things were in Tobolsk, where they had a re relative degree of freedom to move about, to go to church, to go outside, to see people in the outside world. The awful thing that happened when they arrived at Yekaterinburg, they were immediately greeted by a place surrounded by an enormous stockade. A wooden stockade was built right round the house. The windows were painted white. So the family, once they were inside that house, could not see the outside world. They were denied newspapers. They were denied letters and parcels. No visitors. So they were effectively cut off. And what kind of family were they at that stage? Well, they were incredibly close-knit family, very devoted to each other. And I think the thing that one of the fundamental things that held them so closely together was they had this very deep, very profound orthodox faith. And they did take a rather fatalistic attitude to God's will and what would happen happen to, to them. Also, the girls in many ways were very immature for their age, very unworldly. They'd lived such a cocooned life at the Alexander Palace in outside St. Petersburg. Once Alexei was born, found to be haemophiliac, everyone closed in to protect him, to protect the family. So in that way, um, they managed to survive better, I think, than other families would, because they were so, so used to being only in each other's company. But it, it wasn't just the family who were in the Apatiev house, was it? They were also accompanied by some of their old retainers. Well, the retainers were intensely loyal. They volunteered to go with the Romanovs to Yekaterinburg, and it was very uncertain what was going to happen to them. They might, must have had some sense that it might all end horribly. So they're intensely loyal, particularly Dr. Botkin, who I think of all of them had a sense that this might end in something dreadful. He was very pragmatic, very realistic. And one of the last letters he wrote from the house, an unfinished letter said, basically, I don't expect to get out of here alive. But what was interesting was that when the Romanovs first arrived, there was obviously an intensely hostile attitude to them from the guards, mainly very young local factory workers who'd volunteered for what they considered was an honor to guard, you know, his bloodthirsty Tsar and his family. And as time went on, a strange thing happened. Some of these young guards began to develop a sympathy for the family, especially the girls and especially Alexei, who was very, very sick. But as time went on, the guards began to fraternize a bit too much, became a bit too friendly with the girls especially. And that was when there was a massive clampdown and Yakov Yurovsky was brought in and the whole thing changed. And talk to me a bit more about Yakov Yurovsky. He is often portrayed as a sort of maniacal murderer. But in fact, you sort of bring out a, a slightly more complex side to his personality. Well, he was an absolutely ruthless, cold-blooded, pragmatic, dedicated Bolshevik. He was also a local Cheka man. Now, Cheka was the precursor of what became the KGB, the, the Russian Political Secret Service. So he was there for a purpose. He was sent in to enforce a clampdown on the fraternization, to really make the re regime there a very strict prison regime, and effectively to prepare for what was now an increasing eventuality was that, that they might have to kill the family because the white and the counter-revolutionary forces were working their way east from Vladivostok, right in far the far west of Russia, working their way back to, along the Trans-Siberian Railway 
towards Ekaterinburg, which was an, a focal point on the railway line. Amongst the guards, was there any feeling that they weren't going to go through with it? Yes, absolutely. Um, just before they came to kill the family, Yurovsky was issuing orders about who was supposed to kill, kill whom. They were all given a, an individual target. And some of the guards immediately said, we will not kill the girls. And the number of killers in the end was reduced because of that. And in fact, uh, the, the ultimate solution was putting them all in a room and, and killing them all together. But that turned into a bloodbath, didn't it? And you've spoken to a forensic expert. Tell mm. me what, you, what his opinion of what happened was. Well, what concerned me was the terrible inefficiency with which they murdered them. I, I mean, some, some people think they were just lined up in a row, bang, 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 you're dead. It was not like that. It was a dreadful, ill-conceived, ill-executed murder. You can't say it was an execution. It was brutal because, you know, Yurovsky didn't plan it. He didn't check out what, whether they, these guys were good shots. They didn't check the guns. They had a mixture of, of some efficient guns, Brownings and Colts, and also old army issue Nagants, which probably didn't work. They didn't account for the fact they were killing 11 people in a small, dark basement room, which rapidly became full of acrid smoke, noise, panic, hysteria, people screaming and running around. It was an absolute catastrophe because they then had to brutally finish them off. The only one of them, the family really, who had a quick death was actually Nicholas because the minute the, the order came to fire, they all wanted to take a pot, pot shot at the Tsar, of course, so they could say, well, I shot Nicholas. So he died immediately, but the others suffered horribly particularly the children. And then the burial also was... Yeah. Total, um, total mismanaged from the start. Worst of it was that the man in charge of the detail to take the bodies out into the forest in a truck, a, a very rattly old Fiat truck, arrived dead drunk and late with one shovel. <laughs> One shovel to bury eleven people. It was it was just silly. And the other thing was they hadn't properly checked out the site they'd chosen, which was a mine working in the forest. And when they got there, they discovered first of all it was too shallow, and secondly it was full of water. And that to get throw eleven bodies down there, they'd almost immediately be found by the local peasants. So they had to go back the next morning, haul the bodies out, and go and dump them somewhere else. It was just dreadful. Now, the, 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 the murder of the Romanov family is often attributed to a sort of maverick branch of the Ekaterinburg Bolsheviks, but you believe that the order can be traced directly to Lenin. Well, Lenin was very careful to always cover his tracks, and he, he never, ever took responsibility for anything as controversial as the murder of the Romanovs. But he said categorically, we must not have a living banner. We must not have anyone surviving from the family around whom a counter-revolution could could gather and gain, uh, you know, gain gain power. So the decision was made in Moscow during meetings with Galashorkin, a man from the, the Ekaterinburg Soviet, who went back and forth quite a few times to Moscow. Now, Galashorkin was very good friends with Yakov Sverdlov, who was Lenin's right-hand man. Sidloff had worked as a Bolshevik agitator in Ekaterinburg. He knew the city, he knew the Bolsheviks there. And I think fundamentally a tacit agreement was given by Lenin that when the time came and the judgment of when that time came was left to the Ekaterinburg Bolsheviks, when they knew that the game was up, and the city was going to fall, to go in and kill them all. And moving forward to the present day, what would you say is the abiding legacy of the Romanov family? To me, the most interesting thing I found when I went to Russia, when I went to Ekaterinburg, was this incredible devoutness, this sense of identification of the Romanos with orthodoxy. And particularly with everything of Mother Russia, of nationhood, of a united country, that everything that Russia lost under the depredations of 70 years of communism. And the Romanos represent, for ordinary Russians, for believers, a sense of nationhood and orthodoxy that they feel they've lost.